This is Primitive Substance, by the way, your host, Dennis Young. We're talking to Ernie Brooks today, bassist for a long time, played with the Modern Lovers, Arthur Russell, a Love of Life Orchestra. Ernie, thanks for coming on. Right. I should add Gary Lucas. Lucas, I right. Who I just interviewed. So uh, it was in Europe. What? So, so go back to your early yeah. days yeah, now with when you started, how you got interested in music back, back, what was it in Massachusetts? Well, actually it was before I lived in Massachusetts. I remember mm -hmm. going with a cousin. I think we would go up. We knew each other in Maine where my mother and her uh, brother had these two house, little houses in a town called Biddeford Pool, Maine. And we go there in the summers and they mm. took me in, I think the, oh gosh, 62, 63 mm, wow. to the Newport Folk Festival, okay. which, which was, uh, I guess it was, I don't know if it was called the Folk Festival or the Folk and Blues, but I remember the first or second year I was there, one of the years I saw Dylan get brought out by Joan Baez. And they did. Mm. He sang. She, I think she was doing a set and she brought him on. And I mean, I love folk music. I yeah. like Peter Paul Mary. I like John Baez. I liked a lot of that music. But Dylan hit me especially hard. I don't know. Oh, why. he was epic back then. I mean, he, he was, just... he was epic. And, and I remember a little songwriters mm. workshop, right? I mean, 30, 40 people sitting around. I don't know if you remember. Did you ever go to Newport? No, I never went. I've been to Newport, but not to the folk festival. Yeah. And this I remember off the top of my head. There was Dylan, uh, Richard and Mimi Farina, uh, Donovan, uh, Phil Oaks. Oh, my god! It gosh. was just all the people. They call it a topical songwriting workshop. Oh, and man. That, that knocked me out. I, I, I love wow. Phil Oaks. I ain't a march more. And, you know, this built up. This was before, of course, I went to college. This really filled my head and then they had a, a fucking blues workshop where mississippi john hurt oh my gosh uh, um sun house howling wolf uh gosh pretty much the chicago blues the country blues reverend gary davis wow um sleepy john estes i mean you name them they were there i mean this is even muddy before waters the, of course that's even before the beatles hit america you know, you were well, seeing. Was... Wow. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it was funny because I was more into that folk and then the blues through that than I was really into rock. Okay. Uh, and interestingly, then, uh, oh, of course, Pete Seeger there was uh, a big part of that. Oh, he was, yeah. Because he did topical songs. He also mined the folk tradition and was a big influence oh, on yeah. other he, people. He... He was amazing. I remember marching in 2009 and he was, he was really old. He was shuffling yeah. along, but he was singing, you know? Yeah. He, 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 he sang to the end, you know? He was in his nineties. Yeah. yeah. Amazing guy. So anyway, um, so I was influenced by that music. And then I was also, I was born in the city, actually in Manhattan. And my parents moved out to the boring white bread suburb of, uh, Oh, you go. New Canaan, Connecticut, where oh, you know, I was coming from New York. I listened to, I think it was WMCA, uh, Murray the K. Was that, I remember him. Was it 1010 or was that 1010 Wins? I can't remember what it station he was on, but he he was he influenced me. And I loved Dion mm. as a singer. Oh, Almost yeah. I forgot about hits. him. And one beautiful, he had wrote a wonderful, an incredible uh -huh. protest song, Abraham Martin and John, and uh, of course, all those, his great pop hits and and of course, that's I remember hearing him introducing the Beatles. Like he used to call Murray the Case to call himself the fifth Beatle. Oh, about that. I and, didn't know that. And I know he got one of the first interviews with them when they came oh. here. I, I never saw the Beatles. My brother actually, my older brother is like six years old and went to see them at uh, Shea Stadium. I mean, and, uh, they were so far from the You probably seen clips of that where I did. It's 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 wild. It's crazy. I think is that the one where uh, Ringo goes and moves his drums himself so they get to I think so. face another part of the audience. Yeah, but the fans were so far away. Yes, you know, they're yes. like in the stands and they're like a mile away, like on the second base line there of the state of the field. And I and you probably couldn't hear anything no. either. They didn't have big professional sound systems. No, there, no, for that kind of concert. Uh, and it's funny because I remember. 
one of the first big concerts I did go to was the Rolling Stones, I believe in 1965 in Lynn, Mass. Oh. They played at the Lynn Bowl, which was one of those, like, uh, I don't know, probably a you know college, like the size of a small college football place. That's, that's, when, Brian, that's when Brian Brian Jones no was in the band, right? Brian Jones was Brian in the Jones band. was in the band. Yeah, I love Brian right Jones. After, yeah, I remember they did Lady Jane, and he played the the that sitar, the, oh, the he was, lap steel. Yeah, he, he was, was such, amazing. He was such a multi instrumentalist. He was a great musician. extraordinary. Yeah. Anyway, it was a wild concert because uh, it was it started off with uh, you know I don't know if you know the Stondals who did that Dirty Water that right. That song. About Boston, uh, there was a couple other groups I don't remember, but you know it was like all you know it was four or five great, you know, some of them were one hit wonders. I guess. Oh this, yeah. Yeah, you know, but they were cool and it was great. Building up to the Stones, mm. and I, I'll never forget it because a couple things happened. Kids, it started raining. They kind of wanted to shut the concert down. The kids went crazy and stormed. Oh my gosh. Stage. And I remember these big cops, big Irish cops, like carrying Jagger off the stage. Oh. He wouldn't let you singing. I can't get no. I can't uh. get no. And they're carrying him away if, to carry Richards away. <laughs> His guitar is still plugged in. The amp oh, falls man. over in a shower of sparks. Oh. It, the police start throwing tear gas at the audience. It was wild. Oh, wow. But that's, that's a good of, one. That's a good one, yeah. Oh, and man. after that, I, you know, I love Dylan. I'm in, uh, I don't tell if I saw him at Forest. I think I saw him at Forest Hills. Uh, and I saw him in, I remember really well going because I was in school in Vermont and a friend of me went up to Burlington, Vermont and saw him in a University of Vermont gymnasium. And this oh. is where he half, the first half acoustic and then he came out with the band. Oh, and the electric band? Yeah, with the band. Oh, the band, yeah, the band. That must have been good. You know, oh. Robertson and Levi. Oh, Hamm. yeah. That was, that really, you know, moved me the most. Because that, that was right after, I guess, Blonde on Blonde or mm. maybe before the release of that, but he did a lot of those songs. That was incredible. Uh, that must have been, yeah, that was when maybe my last year in high school. Mm. So anyway, then, and during all that time, I started getting, I don't know if it, the music must must have connected with it, of course, because Dylan was singing all about the issues of Patty Carroll. And right. I, at the school I was at, a guy came and talked about the conditions in this uh, African-American part of um, Atlanta, Georgia. Mm. And they people to come down and help with voter registration. Oh, okay. And I, and I went down there for first for a couple of weeks during the spring break. I drove, remember driving down and uh, with a, a bunch of friends from the school that was like what a that really changed my view of of well some aspect of my life you know i mm. came from a privileged white suburb right oh. and and being down yeah. there where i saw that the on the other side of the Atlanta was already starting to be a modern city with skyscrapers and and a lot of you know obviously wealthy neighborhoods but you right. know, it's becoming parts of it looked like you know, New York and, you know, glass yep. buildings, tower, and it was a place called Vine City. And, you know, there were dirt roads, mm. like, houses that look kind of like shacks, you know, just propped up off the mud and uh, on cinder blocks, minimum, uh, what can I say, you know, the system. I mean, uh, yeah, mm. most of them, I think, had, I don't know if all of them, some of them maybe didn't even have electricity. Oh. Some had, you know, basically hardly functioning plumbing. They go up and people open the door and you say, I'm here. Do you know about, you know, the what's coming up and elections and vote? And they look at you blankly. They didn't know what it was. Oh, boy. They, they hadn't heard about it. You know, they've mm. just been so out of the loop economically, socially, educationally. So that was a huge thing. And plus I stayed with a family that somehow through this program, I can't remember, it was, it was run by a guy who was a Unitarian uh, minister or something like that. But anyway, he had good contacts in the neighborhood, and they put us, put me with a family. And I remember uh, sleeping on the couch, and the guy was playing James Brown records all the time. Oh, so okay. That's, that's where I, I really... I feel I'm, good, huh? Yeah. I mean, he, that was his... He, you know, he played, but he played a lot of 
you know, great funky music. And I probably mm. started listening to Aretha, probably a lot of the Motown stuff. Oh, then I, and that was something that stayed with me. I, you know, I went, I can't remember, it was a year before I went down to Alabama and marched behind Martin Luther King, got to see him speak. Oh, okay. Wow. You know, that, that, that 50 mile march that, uh, between right. Selma, yeah. Alabama and Montgomery. And that was, that was, that was pretty amazing. It was terrifying. Some of it. I mean, I personally didn't get hurt, but, uh, so, I mean, I, 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 you know, and I got to say, this is informs me today. I mean, you know, where I live, I'm out my window. It's well, it's blocked by a a hotel, which is now immigrant housing. Right. 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 I I used to be able to see the bridge and beyond that Queensbridge houses, like five blocks from here, which is the biggest, biggest public housing, I think. It's it's really huge and it's in terrible shape, oh. and incredible poverty. Oh, and, nothing and the school, changes, and the, right? And the, nothing changes, right? No, it's all the same. The Supreme Court re- uh, ruled separate is not equal, but in New York, you know, there's efforts made, and but it's still segregated. Yeah, yep. And you also have a situation where the new Gold Coast, which is uh, I'm pretty much directly across from the UN or from the tip of Roosevelt Island. I'm about a block from the river in an old factory building here. Oh, okay. Which is one of it's one of the few kind of legal loft buildings that exists in Queens. But south of me is this new Gold Coast of high rise luxury buildings, and I think the average annual income there is probably, or I don't know if it's the mean or the median. It's like over $150,000 for a family. And then you go north of the bridge, it drops vertical fall off to about 20000 And you, just the difference. Right? Yeah. You know, and, and you see how unequal the development oh, is. Oh, yeah. Well, they have it here, too, in New Jersey. They're, they, just sure. knocked down, they just knocked down this restaurant by me, and now they're building eight luxury homes. Yeah. So, you know, this rich, was ever rich, bought the land, knocked it down. And they're not helping the poor. They no. don't care about that. No, and if you think if there's a real crisis in New York, it's what's crazy. As I said, I've been teaching uh, mostly immigrant families in the Bronx, and it's a part-time job that I do because playing uh, playing music these days is a pretty fickle income. No, I'm sure it's it's up and down. Though I get you know I I, I do it and I love it, but uh, you know it's hard to rely on it to to pay. Yeah, I to can imagine. Pay. You're raise a family but uh yeah no that the whole issue of, of affordable housing because so far what you have in new york is now when you get a right to build a big new building you have to set aside a certain number that are going to be subsidized and less expensive but it's always too few apartments and they're really not affordable for the lower level people no, i can imagine yeah. not no it's set at these different levels and you know they're based on i don't know the mean income for new york which includes all the wealthier parts now because i'm old enough to remember when friends of mine were moving down to um so in the early days in soho we were going over you know taking over factory buildings because that's where the artists and musicians could find cheap right. places to work and live and then and also tribeca and that whole area and then that happened a little bit here as i said the building i'm in is also where when i moved here three uh two and then three jerry harrison and the I moved in around the same time to this loft building, Chris, and they used to rehearse here. And then on the other side of me was a, I don't know if you know the jazz trumpet player who's no longer with us, Don Cherry. Oh, of course. I've heard of him. Right. He was great. Great player. Yeah, great. And played with Ornette Coleman. I think he played with Mm -hmm. Miles Davis. Amazing guy, amazing presence. He used to drift over and jam with my rock band that I had with Arthur Russell here. And uh, anyway, you went to college up in Massachusetts. Is that where you went? Yeah, I was. I, that's where I met uh, Jerry Harrison. We were colleague. We were at Harvard oh, together. Okay. And you know, we were playing in a band, and then I think he first saw. Well, that, that's a segue into Jonathan Richmond. He saw Jonathan playing, uh, I think, by himself on the Cambridge Common there, where they used to have these Sunday afternoon concerts, and I checked him out. And then, before long, he came to our apartment. Brought there by a guy named Danny Fields. I don't know if you know who he is. Uh, he's Nancy. kind of a he's an important figure in the kind of oh, not just underground rock, but I mean, it's it's funny. Be, well, it's not funny. Yeah, he's someone I still see, and I'm 
you know, if I go to a Jonathan Richen show in New York, he's going to be there. Or... Yeah. Anyway, he's he knows kind of he was very important in the development of the doors. I think he did. Publicity. Oh, okay. Then he was very important with the Ramones. He managed the Ramones. Wow. Wow. Didn't know he, that. And he was very important in the evolution of the Stooges. Oh, There's what, a movie about him called Danny Says. Which, I got to uh, check that out. It's yeah, it's yeah. A, a documentary? Or was yeah, it? Danny oh, Says. Gotta... It's, it's pretty well put together. I mean, that's some pretty heavyweights there. Holy smoke. I mean, the Ramones, Stooges, man, and the Doors. That's... Actually, he's... Yeah, yeah. And other people, he also, because he worked, funny, he was a real fan of music, and he wrote for 16 Magazine. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, yeah, of course. Long time ago. It was a real fanzine for pop music. Yep. Yeah. I remember always seeing that in the stores. Yep. You know, 16 yep. Magazine. Yep. yep. And it, it was, you know, it was about movie and TV, but it also a lot about music. Mm. So, I didn't. Anyway, he's a, he, Jerry and I had this apartment with a couple other people. Oh, one of whom was Andy Paley, who is a is a drummer, great all around musician. Who I had actually the first band I was ever in in high school was with him mm. and this other friend who came from California. I had a Rickenbacker twelve string, and it was we did mostly covers. Uh -huh. But but Andy is someone who I'm still friends with, and uh, he he drums on some of the songs that I released on a. French label. I'm working with Brian Wilson. He produced his solo album. And oh, so how he's, about that? Yeah, he's, he's done a lot of interesting stuff. He did a lot of production for Sire Records, too. Oh, yeah. I remember them. Yeah, right. Sire. Seamless with, uh, with Talking Heads, right? Yeah, he signed the Talking Heads. Yeah. He signed the Ramones. He signed oh, man. Uh, the, the Voidoids. Right. So, no, he, was, he was someone of all the record company heads. He used to come all the time to CBGB's. Oh, he put oh, out a record okay. of, of a group called Release, right on a West Coast label called. Release, yeah, I don't know if you've heard of a label called Omnivore. They do a lot of. They're very good at repackaging and re-releasing. No, I haven't heard of them. How do you spell that? What's the name of them? Omnivore. I'm um, okay. Like, I'll I'll look them up. Some of, I guess they, they eat all this old music. Oh and, yeah, right. <laughs> I, that's a great title. Yeah, and uh, you know that. So I've been. It's a great name. Talking to a woman for a long time. And, they're also going to put his first album, which okay. is going to include some some new material or new old material or new mixes, and uh, so we have high hopes for that. Oh, okay, That's but everything good. takes time. Oh yeah, you know, T took us forty years to make any money with Liquid Liquid. You know, that's what it is. Oh yeah, what were you? What were you with Liquid Liquid? I was a percussionist, a right. rimba player. And, uh, you know, we had that big thing with White Lines uh, when they stole our song, the samples. And did you then did you? And Nine Nine oh, went wow. out of business after that, after our record, Cavern. That's what it was. They, st they stole it from Cavern. And hmm. uh, but, you know, we didn't make any money when we were playing. We made money with the gigs, but we never made any money with the label. And then, you know, now we finally have some of our rights back. And we're finally making a little bit of money from it. Yeah, because you had stuff that, that was out there and sold quite a bit at the time, right? Uh, well, we did the, the, the Optimo record, not the you others as much. I think maybe at that time, I don't know, it was more than 10,000 records. I don't know what, what how many Ed really sold, Ed Bauman. But after well, that, the... it folded it up. Wow. Did you play, or was it just some people... Uh, from Liquid, I remember seeing it Damrosh Park in Lincoln Center. This yeah, was we pl I played. I, we played that show with um, Reese Chatham. Okay, because I was part of Reese's band. Yeah, yeah. I I I did four hours with Reese in an interview. What? It was incredible. Yeah, they opened up the show. Yeah, he's and then we played. He's a yeah. he's an amazing character. He sure is. I know. I've oh. known him because he actually he and Arthur Russell were roommates. In the oh, okay. early 70s, and he was a musical director at the kitchen. Right. And then he, for whatever reason, he has handed that off to Arthur, I guess in 75, maybe. Okay. And it's funny because that band I had with Arthur 
kitchen and we record there. They had a four track TIAC machine. And we, I used hmm. to actually, I slept there sometimes before I moved into the loft over here. How about they, that? They, yeah. They had these nice brown, uh, you know, foam cushions. Hmm. I put them together, make a little bed and sleep there because, and then we'd get up and start working on music. Yeah. Reese had more stories. I mean, his first show was all about minimalism music. And mm-hmm. he's such an expert on all of this. Oh, yeah. No, he, a phenomenal, he knows... phenomenal interviews. I'm of Phil Glass, of Steve Reich. Oh, yeah. I, it's funny because I, I, I know a lot of, I mean, the guy that, that first band I had with Arthur, Arthur was kind of part of that world. I mean, he was not a, really a protege, but I remember Philip Glass, he put this a sticker on one of his things. He said that he is the best young composer in New York. Mm. That for, after, this was post-mortem. But they said the quote from Philip Glass when he was still alive. Oh wow! Well, let's Glass talk about right. let's talk about Arthur now. Arthur Russell. Everybody out there knows that name. You played with him. Yeah. Uh, let's hear your stories about Arthur that that you can share. I'm sure okay, you have a well, lot. Guess, but yeah, yeah. I mean, he few was, good ones. <laughs> okay. No, he actually. I got to say, he really ended up being one of my best friends. I mean. He was kind of, I mean, he was clearly someone whose musicianship, you know, he he could play classical music, he could play pop music. You know, the time I spent with Arthur was definitely the time when I felt the most, you know, that I had a kindred spirit, someone I was able to work with, co-write songs with. And he was like, really, what was great about him, I think, was his openness. I mean, he'd play with... You know, he played with so many people from so many different. Yeah, worlds. I mean, he, and I mean, so I was just a dumb rock and roller, right? I mean, it was difficult because it's constantly changing. Yeah, meter and uh, you know the, you know, as I said, measures cut in half, odd juxtapositions of you know notes and chords, and especially that piece. It's called Instrumentals, which mm. we actually finally did a tour that Reese was part of. Reese, oh, about that. Reese played flute, and Peter Gordon was kind of director. Oh, that must have been great. Sax. Your Zumo bonus who played a lot with Arthur was right. on that tour. And Bill Rule on on traps, right. and who else did we have? Oh, a guy named Ned Sublet. You know him? No, no. Oh, you should know him. I probably a, know him if I saw him. If he's I saw funny. him, he, he's got. A, he's got. A, I. He does this. I, he's, I, when I first met him, he was a songwriter, singer, and doing these quasi-country songs. I recorded a bunch of stuff with him in Lubbock. And one of the songs he recorded there is called Cowboys Are Secretly, Frequently Fond of Each Other. Oh, how about But he kept, he kept trying to get it out there. And finally, I guess a, two or three years ago, Willie Nelson recorded it. Oh. And another guy who I see is coming to New York, who is... I'm gay, and he recorded. And it's quite the, the, the. I think there's one of him and this other guy's name escapes me, but I'm sure I could find it and send it to you. But these years later, that song is caught on. So, where else did you guys play um, with Arthur? Did you play around different parts of? We were just really. I mean, that band we played uh, CBGs. We played. It's funny because he was also someone who worked a lot with Alan Ginsberg. Oh yeah, I, played, I remember that. I play. I played a couple times with Alan Ginsberg and Arthur at CBGBs. Oh okay. And I remember doing two great songs that stand out. Was everybody's a little bit homosexual, whether they like it or not, and talking CIA dope calypso blues. <laughs> uh, pretty cool. And uh, but we played at the Lower Manhattan Ocean Club. Which I was what, that. You, you know who Mickey Rusk? Oh yeah, Ben was yeah. Nightclub figure started Maxis, Kansas City, and then he had this place, uh, the Lower Manhattan Ocean Club. I remember playing there both with the Flying Hearts and the Love of Life Orchestra. And then there was a place, God, what was it? It was like a loft space on Warren Street where they had concerts, and we played at the. Oh my God. The other end, we played. I remember that. We never got big. I mean, we sort of, as I said, some of those songs have gotten released posthumously. And I'm actually still trying to work things out with Arthur's estate to put out a Flying Hearts record, which has never come out. And one of the interesting things we did was recording for John Hammond, 
John Hammond, oh, senior. Oh, senior yeah, was, John Hammond. Yeah, he that's was a big name. Talk about guy who had stories. Wow, let's hear that about, about Dylan, about uh, Bruce Springsteen. Yeah, about, uh, that's really huge. Billy Holly. He was, he was he was amazing because I I have the tape of our you know we did these demo tapes for him at the old CBS studios on. Um, 52nd Street. It was a oh, okay. classic studio where everything is all, you walk in, everything's set up. How right? about that? You know, the union uh, guys might come and move a little bit here, but. A mic it, up and everything ready, right? Yeah, everything's ready. You just play. I mean, the, the tapes, I keep thinking if we got, if I get the whole of the master tapes, maybe that'll just to bring them up to more current sound standards. But they, I mean, they sound bad. They're basically well recorded, but it's just his comments, his his, you know, elegant patrician voice and, you know, in, in the background all the time. But no, he was, a, he was a good guy. And it's weird because that was, I always figured, okay, doing this stuff with him was going to lead to a contract with CBS. It never did. And oh. part of it, I think, was that Arthur just kept moving on. Either you're a rock and roller, you're a disco guy, or and Arthur didn't seem to want to be an A. He wanted to no, be no, in no. all of it. No, he wanted to be in all of it. He yep. was he, he was difficult. I mean, uh, the story I tell all the time is we were headed to, this is the necessaries. <laughs> we were headed to play in Washington. We used to play gigs quite often with uh, REM. In the oh, New York, okay. New York, they'd open for us, and we went to Washington, D.C. See, that was kind of a, you know, it was a good club in Washington, and we, we were going to open for them. And he took his cello and he just jumped out of the van at the mouth of the Holland Tunnel. He jumped out of the van? He said, "I'm, you know, he, he didn't really say he's quitting. He said, I can't go to this gig. I have something really important to do. And everybody was flipped out. Oh, my gosh. And then he came to apologize when we got back a few days later. And, you know, it was like the rest of the band was Ernie. You know, you've got this guy in the band. What the yeah. hell? We were a trio. But, and this is when right at the point where our album was supposed to be coming out. And, you know, so... I've had some bad luck with, I mean, Jonathan Richmond was not the easiest guy to work with. And Arthur, I got to say, was not the easiest guy to work with. Though, I miss the guy. Like I'm crazy. sure you do. I mean, I mean. You know, we used to talk to each other. I mean, for a while I was living in Paris um, and he would call me, you know, at four in the morning because he forget about the time difference. Yeah. And, start reading. This is a new song I wrote. And he wrote so many songs. I have so many cassettes with songs that you know mm. never been released that some are finished some aren't but they're all you know melodically rhythmically really interesting really. now who has the property of those tapes can you get them and, and good question i have what i own unfortunately uh you know after he died i had a lot of big boxes of tapes and i left them because actually i'd been living in france and i sublet my loft here i said oh man this is not a good place for you know for Tapes because right, of right. tapes, you know, they were not digital, and they were, they were too hot and humid there because she had no air conditioning. So I brought them in and gave them basically to uh, Steve Newson, who ran, still runs Outica Records. Okay, and he became part of the estate, started working with Arthur's boyfriend, and I think Arthur's mother may have been, or father, his father passed away. I think the mother just passed away. I never thought I was going to have. Uh, you know, I it's I'm still I guess I'm too circumspect about really knowing the too right close way to it, huh? Well, yeah, I mean, I always thought, okay, Arthur, you know, when we when we were worked together, we shared everything. Yeah, I mean, a, lot, a lot of the tapes we did, we both paid for. Whoever had a hundred bucks in his account, hey, you chip in towards recording costs. Yeah, and a lot of those tapes now, all of them, with the New York Public Library mm. uh, recording. What is it? The Recording Arts Division, or it's the Arts Division? Anyway, they have a big library in Lincoln Center, right? Where I know uh, Lou Reed's stuff is, and, mm. and Arthur's archives got sold to them, including you know sheet music. I, mean, I have a lot of that. So cool. they take the tapes and everything, and, and they have the tapes and they how about that. Them. They oh. tell the and I'm still trying to figure like, you know, what should I do? That's so it's a, it's a weird situation. I yeah. still haven't really figured legally. I mean, once you start going legally, then that can be, it can work out or it can be a big mess and ends up leaving you. Yep. Oh, we know that. Like, now, with, now, with the, now with the modern lovers, uh, 
So are you have anything new? Are you going to be doing any more box sets or are you going to be? Well, I hope issuing? so. That, yes, this is also, I believe. I want to hear about that. Yeah, hopefully it's going to come out on that label. Which okay. is a, it's a good label and they're very enthusiastic. They're still waiting to talk to the drummer, David Robinson. I don't know if you know him. He's no. He went out to the Cars. So he had a really successful career. Wow. He went played with the Cars? Yeah. Yeah. He was oh, there. man. Yeah, it was very important to them. He did all their... He had a lot to do with the concept of their music. Anyway, he, um, I've been in touch with him and Jerry. Of course, we talk all the time. Jerry Harrison and we're cool. And Jonathan, we talk to once in a while. I Lizzie didn't, Kelsey's Jonathan I didn't get to I see that Remain in Light tour with Adrian Ballou. I heard that was really good. Jerry yeah, played. I saw him. I saw him twice. I saw him in well, I saw him in New York City. I don't know a year ago, and I saw him in August up in uh, Tarrytown at this. Oh, thing. okay. Yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah. Adrian is, you know, he's a pretty amazing guitar oh, player. Oh, he's a phenomenal. Yeah. You know, he can, he's, he's a wizard on guitar yeah. and yeah. effects yeah. and pedals. And well, hopefully this is going to come out. I mean, we're, you know, at least, at the very least, it's going to sound a lot better. Hopefully we have a lot of, um, you know, we remaster and, as I said, get some tracks that haven't come out before and, I don't know what else. I'm trying to throw in a, maybe some good live material if I can get a hold of that. And um, and then we're also trying to make a movie through this. And the problem with that is really no, there's no film of that group. That was like is so it? long ago. Well, we haven't been able to find any. Hmm. The last thing we heard about somebody who maybe recorded us in a high school, South Cohasset, oh. South Boston High School, but he passed away and maybe his sister threw it away. We oh, don't that's know. too bad. Because again, the modern lover is like, we, you know, we were not, you know, we sort of got this reputation, but we didn't play college Harvard mixers and uh, little clubs in Boston. And then, you know, twice really in New York, once when we were sort of already falling apart, when that's when I met Arthur. But before that, we played a big show at the Mercer Art Center with the Dolls. Oh boy, that must I'd love to hear those stories about David Johansson. That must be you got yeah. so much stories. Oh. oh yeah, he's a great guy. I mean, he seemed like it. I I run into him every once in a while. And uh, uh, I played on one solo. Yeah, I know that. Uh, here comes the night, right? And then I gave that for the, Yeah, which is actually I really got some good songs on it. Yeah. Yeah, that is yeah, I am actually I was I was calling him. Actually, I spoke to his wife, uh, I don't know, last week, trying to say if he had any ideas of any tapes, videotapes that might have come from that night at the Mercer Art Center. Because that mm. was a wild night. That was like a... I can imagine. The dolls? Oh, my it was God. Like, it was like glitter, glitter rock. Earth uh, punk. Yeah. You know, it was when the first, you know, people in high heel, you know, the platform yeah. shoes and glitter and then also... Him and Alice Cooper, you know, those two guys were like... Yeah. Those two bands were yeah. like the 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 thing. Hey, listen, it's great talking. So you too. Let's let's get together again. You got so many stories well, and such great memories. I mean, you're part of that history of this whole city well, here, Ernie, of the whole era. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, well, yeah. you've been there, so, seen it, done it. <laughs> I've done so. All right. It. So nice talking right. to you. I'll talk to you soon. Take Have care. Have a good day now. Take you care. Too.